Hi, thank you for joining us for today's message from Calvary in Lake Havasu. We continue in the Message to a Messed Up Church series today with a conversation regarding the role of women in church. The scriptural reference is 1 Corinthians 11, 2 through 16. Life Notes can be found at calvaryaz.com forward slash life notes. Now, here is Pastor Chad Garrison and Amber Smith. I'm going to invite you to have a seat and grab your Bible or your Bible app and turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. 1 Corinthians 11 is our text. And uh, if you don't have a Bible with you and you're on our Sweetwater campus, that's perfectly fine. There's Bibles in the seats around you. Grab one of those. Turn to page 1138. That's 1138. You'll be able to follow along. If you're joining us from our Parker campus, then uh, there's a table right in the middle of the room. You can just get up right now, go back there, grab a Bible, turn to page 1138, and you'll be able to follow along with us. And no matter which campus you're at, if uh, you don't have a Bible and you want one, take one of those with you. We want you to have a Bible and be able to read the Bible. If you're joining us online and you don't have a Bible and you want one, just message us. Uh, service hosts can, uh, can take that message or you can email us at calvaryaz.com. We'd be glad to get you a Bible because uh, we know if you read God's Word and apply God's Word, God is going to change your life. Amen. So, hey, uh, today we have the opportunity and responsibility to share a message from Scripture that I, I know may offend half of you. <laughs> okay, I, I'm just uh, saying that. We're, we're talking about the role of women in the church, and we're starting in 1 Corinthians 11, going to spill over into 1 Corinthians 14 a little bit. And since I am a coward, no, I uh, no, invited. <laughs> All right, I know I'm not. But uh, I invited Amber Smith, our serve director, to join with me in teaching this message. Because uh, I thought if we're discussing uh, women in the church and in ministry, then uh, I thought that a woman involved in ministry who holds a Master's of Divinity from Southern Seminary and is our serve director could be a great help in uh, presenting that. So. Uh, for those of you who are new, and for full disclosure, she's also my oldest daughter. So, uh, yeah, some of you are like, oh, I did not know that. Now you do. Uh, hey, look, churches have been fighting about the role of women for about 2,000 years. So I don't expect us to solve anything today. Okay? I, I mean, we're going to answer some questions. We're probably going to raise some questions. And uh, you may have some, you know, uh, more questions out of this. But we're going to share with you kind of how uh, we understand Scripture and explain how Calvary navigates this issue. So uh, one request and one only, please listen to the entire message before expressing your outrage. Uh, <laughs> please listen to the entire message. And then if you have questions or comments or would like to uh, ask something of either of us, then uh, email us or make an appointment. We'd be glad to talk further about this. We'll be available after the service as well. So uh, we're going to start off 1 Corinthians chapter 11. I'm going to pick up in verse 2 where the Apostle Paul says, Now I commend you because you remember me in everything and maintain the traditions even as I deliver them to you. But I want you to understand that the head of every man is Christ... The head of a wife is her husband, and the head of Christ is God. Every man who prays or prophesies with his head covered dishonors his head, but every wife who prays or prophesies with her head uncovered dishonors her head, since it is the same as if her head were shaven. For if a wife will not cover her head, then she should cut her hair short, but since it is disgraceful for a wife to cut off her hair or shave her head, let her cover her head. For a man ought not to cover his head, since he is the image and glory of God, but woman is the glory of man. For man was not made from woman, but woman from man. Neither was man created for woman, but woman for man. That is why a wife ought to have a symbol of authority on her head, because of the angels. Nevertheless, in the Lord, woman is not independent of man, nor man of woman. For as woman was made from man, so man is now born of woman, and all things are from God." Judge for yourselves, is it proper for a wife to pray with her head uncovered? Does not nature itself teach you that if a man wears long hair, it is a disgrace for him? But if a woman has long hair, it is her glory. For her hair is given to her for a covering. If anyone is inclined to be contentious, we have no such practice, nor do the churches of God. 
Yeah, 1 Corinthians 14, 34 and 35 says, the woman should keep silent in the churches for they are not permitted to speak, but should be in submission as the law also says. If there is anything they desire to learn, let them ask their husbands at home for it is shameful for a woman to speak in church. So these passages and others, like 1 Timothy 2, 1 Peter 3, raise questions that we have to struggle with as followers of Jesus. So if you believe that Jesus actually is the one and only Son of God and Savior of the world, if you believe that Jesus died on the cross to pay for your sins and was raised from the dead, and you've made a commitment to follow Jesus with your life, then this applies to you. Now, if you're not a follower of Jesus, we want you to be a follower of Jesus. We'd love to include you in the lake baptism next weekend, uh, all that. But, but here's the thing. Uh, listen in because this is God's word to us. Now, if you're a follower of Jesus, then the first point of struggle is simply this. Do you affirm the authority of the Bible? Do you affirm the authority of Scripture? You say that Jesus is your Lord, are you going to believe God's word as your, you know, order of how you're going to do life? See, at Calvary, we officially embrace God's word as our guide for faith and practice. Our first essential belief. By the way, if you haven't taken intro, you'll, this is covering some of those things. So we have five essential beliefs here at Calvary. Uh, you can see them on our website if you're new, you want to check them out. But the first one is we believe the Bible is the inerrant inspired word of God that tells us what to believe and how to live. Okay, yeah. we, we believe that scripture is our authority. Yeah. So we have this temptation to reject the authority of scripture. And sometimes we come to passages like these um, and they make us a little bit uncomfortable. Um, and we read them and we're like, mm, I don't really know if I like that. I'm just going to skip over it. I'm not going to pay attention to that so much. Um, and it's not just passages that talk about women. It can be passages that talk about anything from anger or unforgiveness, um, how we spend our money, not getting drunk, how we talk to people, or how we live out our sexuality. But no matter what the topic is, when we come to passages that have that knee-jerk reaction of like, I don't like this for whatever reason, we need to stop and ask ourselves, do I believe that the Bible is the inspired, inerrant word of God that is completely true and accurate? And am I going to follow it no matter what it says? Am I going to choose to submit my thoughts, my desires, uh, my plans to what God says and follow him even if I don't like what it says? See, we cannot pick and choose what we're going to believe from the Bible. We either follow God completely or not at all. In Revelation 3, Jesus says that he's going to spit out the church of Laodicea from his mouth because they are lukewarm. They were picking and choosing what they were following from Jesus and disregarding the things they didn't like. See, we cannot be wishy-washy when we are following Jesus. We have to be fully committed to following him. So are you going to let God have authority over all of your life, every aspect of your life? If that is yes, then we need to study scripture and understand why it was originally written, to who it was written to, the purpose they were writing to, and then once we understand that, then we can apply it to our lives today. So if Calvary affirms biblical authority, the question is, why am I sitting here teaching with my head uncovered? <laughs> so that leads the question to how do we understand these passages? See, um, these passages have been uh, used and abused in ungodly ways through the years, especially when you realize how affirming and uplifting Scripture is for the place of women. Uh, in the way that Jesus taught and modeled and, and uh, just showed us in, in his actions, interactions with people, he elevated the role of women in their culture, both in his teachings and in his personal behavior. Uh, I mean, and, and just think about the, some of the roles of women in Scripture. I mean, there's no story of Jesus without his mom, Mary. Uh, one of the biggest things that we don't realize because of the culture that we're in, but the the, the people who first encountered Jesus when he was raised from the dead were who? Women. 
Women. Yeah, they were women. And, and here's the crazy thing, if, especially if you're you know, talking with some of your unbelieving friends who are saying, well, the Bible's just a myth. No, uh, in first century Israel, women were not even allowed to be witnesses in court. And yet in all the Gospels, who encounters Jesus first? It's women. And, and I think that God did that on purpose. Uh, if you go on in Acts, there's a couple, Priscilla and Aquila, who are serving as missionaries. Uh, Philip the deacon, who uh, is throughout the early part of Acts, had four daughters. They were prophetesses and prophesied over Paul in his journeys. And the Apostle Paul actually wrote the words in Galatians chapter 3 that says, There is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free. There is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. St. Paul that wrote this whole statement about, about women in, to, to the church in Corinth. So the, the first rule when you're studying the Bible is culture and context. Who was this written to? What was it written about? And what was the writer trying to communicate to his readers? And that's where we, as people who believe in the Bible, need to understand how to read the Bible because there is a difference between moral laws and cultural rules. Moral laws and cultural rules. Think back to the, to the Old Testament with me, if you're familiar with this. Uh, you guys ever hear the Ten Commandments? Yeah, Ten Commandments. You guys know the Ten Commandments, right? I'm not going to ask you to quote them right now, but you're familiar with them. You know, they include stuff like, you know, you shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, don't covet, all that stuff. Uh, and, and so those are moral laws, which are universal. They don't ever go out of fashion. They don't ever stop being relevant. They, they apply to everyone at all time. But at the same time, in that same context, uh, there were all kinds of laws given to the people of Israel that were cultural laws, like food laws, mm -hmm. right? You guys ever read the Old Testament food laws? Well, in Israel, they're still living those out as a culture. They're called kosher eating. Mm -hmm. uh, anybody ever ate, eaten kosher? It's boring because you can't mix meat and cheese. <laughs> Can I just tell you, I reject those cultural rules for my living because I'm going to have a cheeseburger. I'm going to have pizza. cheese and meat on my pizza. Uh, so these are important things. They, but they had other rules. They have you know, cultural rules about Sabbath mm -hmm. and about what you can and can't do on the Sabbath, so much so that in Israel they have Sabbath elevators so you mm -hmm. don't have to push the button. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, just, they, had, they even had cultural laws about women and their menstrual cycle. And if we still followed those today, we would only be in public two weeks out of the month. So thankfully, we don't have to follow those. So, uh, so moral laws and cultural rules. You need, we need to be aware of the difference in those two things. And, and this passage is about culture and context. Now, having just come, in, come back from Africa and worshiping with uh, people in Zambia, look, they do church different than we do church. They worship different than we worship. Okay, they, they apply things in the gospel differently than we apply it because their culture is different. And, and just as Zambia is different from the United States of America, hey, the United States of America is different than we were 100 years ago. I mean, 100 years ago, women had just, you know, gotten the approval to vote. And, and so there, there's been a, a movement in culture. And that's one of the geniuses of the gospel is that Jesus is introduced to the culture and then redeems the culture. Other religions try to make the culture conform to their religion. That's what Islam does. It's monocultural. And so they say, oh, if you're going to be like us, you've got to adopt our culture, our language, everything. But, but Jesus steps into the culture and says, I'm going to transform you and your culture in the midst of that. And, uh, and so this passage is about culture and context. And by the way, if you went to a Muslim-dominated country right now, this passage would be pertinent to the people in that culture yeah. because the women are still covered and they're still not interacting with men in public. So just some information about first century Corinth and Roman culture that influences this passage. Women's place in those cultures depended on, on sort of who they were. So Jewish women, who at the time were slightly above property in their culture, uh, always were veiled in public, always. And they never talked to men in public. They weren't even allowed to speak or read the scriptures in the synagogue. Okay, so that was their place. Greek women who were uh, reputable were secluded from society. They didn't go out very much. When they did, they did not speak in mixed company. And then Roman women who were respectable had a lot more rights. And so they could own businesses and they could, uh, you know, uh, you know were, were 
owned property. They had all kinds of rights, but they usually did not speak in public gatherings. They still had a place. And then there were other women. Now, most of these were considered loose and immoral. They were prostitutes. They were slaves. Uh, they had no rights. They were signified by their clothing, and these women were seen as immodest and outspoken. Yeah, so Paul is addressing the church in Corinth. He's writing to the Christians at Corinth. And um, the city of Corinth, their main deity that they worshiped was the Greek goddess of Aphrodite, and she was the goddess of love. Um, and they had multiple temples in Corinth dedicated to her, um, but they had one main temple. It was the largest temple, and it had about a thousand temple prostitutes for people to come worship there. Um, and so uh, one way to identify these prostitutes were they had their heads shaved. The women had their heads shaved. Another cultural thing is that men who worshiped in pagan temples, when they prayed to their idols, they would cover their heads. Um, another thing is that women who did not have their head covered in society out in public were either seen as a prostitute or someone who was an adulteress. So you can see that there's a lot of cultural things going on that Paul is addressing here. He's telling the Christians in Corinth to stop acting like people that don't know Jesus because as followers of Jesus, we are supposed to live and act differently so we can represent Christ to the world around us. See, the women, by having their hair un uncovered, were not respecting their husbands by walking around saying, I'm acting like an adulteress, and they weren't respecting Christ because they were abusing their freedom in Christ by confusing people about what it means to follow Jesus. And so any time that we abuse our freedom in Christ or act in a way that leads someone away from Jesus, we are in the wrong here. And so since Paul is addressing how the people in Corinth were to dress themselves, I think we can address that today as well. Um, so some questions. Is your political shirt being a hindrance to the gospel? Is you wearing a Calvary shirt out in public and being rude to the waitress or someone in a grocery store being a hindrance to the gospel? I will take this shirt away. Yeah. <laughs> in that moment, if I see you. Yeah. Is your immodesty hindering the message of the gospel? See, Paul is telling the women um, not to look like prostitutes. And I think we can say the same thing today. Our culture encourages women to wear as little clothing as possible. Our culture says, hey, it's okay to wear a sports bra as a shirt. Well, guess what? It's not. Um, see, Paul writes that whatever we do in word or deed, we need to do it to glorify God. And so we can ask ourselves when we get dressed in the morning, is my outfit, is the clothing that I'm wearing glorifying God? Um, as for chapter 14, these are not a prohibition for women never to speak in church, because otherwise I would be sinning right now. Um, but if you look at the context of where these verses are in the book of 1 Corinthians, in chapter 14, Paul is specifically addressing the interpretations of tongues and prophecy. And so, Paul is saying women should not interpret tongues or prophecy. So he's limiting what women can do. But he's not saying women cannot speak ever in church because otherwise he would be contradicting himself in chapter 11 and the Bible never contradicts itself. And so he's saying there are a few things women cannot do in church, but they can speak if they are dressed appropriately. So does that help you guys understand the culture and the context of this passage and the moral laws and the cultural laws a little bit? Does that make sense? I hope that, hopefully that makes some sense. Because now we want to talk about two primary theological views. Now, again, the church has been arguing and discussing how to understand these passages and what it means. We're sharing uh, some of ours, but there's two competing views uh, that are both biblical on how to approach the role of women. Uh, now, I'm just going to say this. It doesn't really matter which view you hold as long as it's a biblical viewpoint. Okay, you need to make sure you understand why you believe it and how it is supported in Scripture uh, as long as you understand the, the biblical part and as long as you respect people who have different views. Okay, because we want to be united in 
love and in mission, not uh, fight about, you know, all the, the lesser doctrines. This is an important doctrine, but it's not essential here at Calvary. So, um, Amber, talk about the first few. Yeah, the first view is complementarian, um, which emphasizes God's created order. Um, so it says God made man first to be the leader. Um, then God made the woman to be the partner, the helpmate, and to complement the man. This view recognizes that men and women are both um, equal in God's sight. They are both made in the image of God, but they have different roles uh, given to them by God from creation. Okay. The other viewpoint is called egalitarian, and it emphasizes the equality of all believers. And uh, I, the key verse, again, I already read, was Galatians chapter 3, verse 28. In Christ there is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free. There is no male or female, for you are all one in Christ. So this view holds that in Christ, all the markers of gender, education, position, status are wiped out. And God can do whatever he wants to do with whoever he wants to do it, uh, to accomplish his purposes. Now, um, I just want to share with you my personal conviction, and because uh, I the lead pastor, you might be wondering what I, I believe. So I am complementarian in my uh, understanding of Scripture. Now, between complementarian and egalitarian, let's just pretend like this aisle is the dividing line between the two sides, and I'm just sitting on the aisle, you know, or just off the aisle. Not very far apart. There are some people on the extremes, you people on the sides, you're the, you know, radicals uh, on the two sides. <laughs> but uh, I just want you to see, I, you know, I'm, I'm a complementarian. I'm just not a hardcore complementarian. Uh, and, uh, and because of that, what I'm saying is I believe that the world and our lives and our families operate best when we follow God's created order in this world. Okay, that's just how our life is going to work out best when we follow that. Now, I also believe that God can do whatever he wants to do with whoever he decides to do it with to accomplish his purposes, that there are exceptions to his order, but usually he works by following his created design. Yeah. Um, I also believe that churches and societies have abused complementarian views mm -hmm. in ungodly ways, and some still do. Yeah. So uh, Amber experienced that a little bit because she went to a very strongly complementarian seminary, and a lot of the guys didn't really like you being there studying no. theology, did they? They wouldn't even talk to me, so. Okay. <laughs> so, okay. So since you lived through that, what is your personal conviction? Yeah. Um, I am also complementarian. Not because my... I told you. No, not because okay. <laughs> you told me, but because I studied the Bible for myself, um, and this is what I came to believe. Um, I believe that God created man to be the leader of his family um, and to love and serve his wife. And I believe that um, the wife is supposed to submit to her husband and respect him. Um, I've actually had a lot of people think that I was egalitarian because I'm a woman in ministry and I have opinions and will make them known. Um, but I'm not, I'm complementarian um, because I will use my gifts and abilities under the authority and leadership of my husband, Robert, um, and also under the male leadership of the church. So I do not ever want to be a pastor. I don't need that title. Um, and I would never want to be up here teaching on my own. Um, this also plays out in my marriage where Robert and I have a partnership and we discuss things and make decisions together. But if we're ever in disagreement um, and it's not something um, against the Bible, um, then I will submit and let him make the decision. So, so at Calvary, what that means is that the lead pastor is going to be a guy, okay? Uh, lead pastor is not going to be a woman. We're not going to ordain women as pastors. Uh, but at the same time, we will affirm and <laughs> empower women uh, to use their giftedness to teach, to serve, to lead, and influence for the kingdom of God. Okay, that, I mean, that's, that's our commitment. And and by the way, we have women serving on staff in director positions. Amber is director of Serve Ministries. Juliana Bowen is our children's ministry director uh, here at Calvary. Uh, our student and children's directors down at Parker Campus are both women. Uh, we also have women at the highest level of decision-making here at Calvary. Uh, if you took intro, you know this. We, we offered it last time. We'll take it next time when we offer next steps. But we explained that we have a, an executive council, and that executive council is made up of nine people who hold your, your pastors accountable and provide wisdom and insight at decision-making. And uh, there, we have a council instead of elders because in the Bible, elders are men, and uh, we wanted women to be a part of that leadership team. So we have a council 
And about one third of that council right now is made up of godly women. So uh, that, that's how we are navigating this, this issue. Now, finally, um, we want to make some applications. Some, just some basic applications to our life, to your life, to how we live this out. Uh, first of all, we are equal creations with different accountabilities. Okay, we're equal creations with different accountabilities. That's the whole complementarian understanding. Uh, Genesis chapter 1 says, God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Okay, uh, and again, we believe that's a, that's a God thing. We are created in God's image. And, and that means all of us are. Not some of us, but all of us. And we are all equally valued by God. We are all equally loved by God. We are all equally redeemed by Jesus. And we are called to serve him as part of our responsibilities. Yeah. So let's talk about the family order. Um, we all want to have a good, healthy family. Um, the problem is that we try to do life our own way. Um, and this includes how we structure and live out our family lives. Um, and so it goes back to, are we going to submit every aspect of our life to God and follow his design for our lives? So do you guys want to have a healthy, thriving family? Yes. Yes. Good. Okay. Um, if you do, then try and follow God's design. So, the, uh, uh, so Ephesians chapter 5, I encourage you to read the second half of that uh, when you go home. Uh, after church and just uh, talk about it as spouses. But it starts with husbands love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Husbands love your wives as Jesus loves the church. And he sacrificed himself to save the church and to bring them into relationship with him. So guys, that means uh, you're never abusive, you're never demanding, you're never controlling. You want to serve your wife and love her and bless her as you lead the family. Yeah. And wives, um, this means that you will submit to your husband and respect him. And I know the word submission, again, is like, I don't want to do that. I've heard people like, I don't have to submit to anyone. Um, but well, you that's, do if you're a follower of Jesus yes, because exactly. you got to su submit to him. You do need to submit to Christ. And if we're going to submit to Christ, that means we're going to submit to our husbands. Um, and it's not because you want to or you like the idea, but it's because you're choosing to surrender your life to Jesus and follow him and trust him with your life and your marriage. Um, and respect your husband. This will make a huge difference in your marriage if you can respect and encourage your husband. So um, I want to give you a story from my own life um, of how this has played out. And I want to make it clear, I am not suggesting anyone do this or they need to do this. This is just how it's played out in my life. So um, <clears throat> when I was pregnant with my daughter, Emily, Robert and I could not agree on a name. The whole nine months she was born, we could not agree on a name. So we're like, all right, we'll think about it. And then the next day, while we're still in the hospital, we'll decide on a name. Well, the next day came, we still could not agree on her name. So I prayed about it and I was like, okay, God, I'm gonna practice biblical submission. So I told Robert, we cannot agree. I'm gonna practice biblical submission and you can name her whatever you want. Um, and so he named her Emily Joy and I didn't like it and I did not call her Emily for the first month she was born. <laughs> Um, <laughs> I like it now, it just took me a while. Um, but <laughs> that's just a way that it's played out in our marriage of like, it's not a big enough issue for us to like get mad at each other. And so I choose to submit and let him make that decision. But um, when both the husband and the wife are doing what God has called them to do, your needs are gonna be met. You're gonna feel loved and appreciated. Um, and if I could just encourage you guys as couples, go home and this week read Ephesians 5 together and see what God teaches you as a couple. Yeah, I had no idea about that story until we were working on this sermon together. So, uh, <laughs> the, uh, hey, finally, everyone is created and gifted to make a difference in this world. Every single person is created by God and gifted by God to make a difference in this world. God made us in his image. He gifted us as his servants. And God expects us to serve him. Okay, he, just, he expects us to make an impact in this world 
in Jesus' name. And since I'm sitting next to our serve director, I'll let her carry it. <laughs> yeah, God gave each of us different gifts and abilities and talents that he wants us to use um, to glorify him. Um, we are called to work together as the body of Christ. We're not supposed to be lone wolf Christians going off on our own, doing our own thing. We all have different gifts and abilities so that we can come together and work together to accomplish the mission of God. And um, we all have a God-given um, purpose in life to uh, worship and glorify God in all that we do. Um, and when you use the gifts and abilities that God has given you to serve others and to make a difference for Jesus, you will find so much joy and fulfillment in life. Um, and so I would encourage you guys to do that, but start at home. Start by serving your family at home. Um, this is so important and it will ch drastically change the dynamic of your family. So if you're married, start serving your spouse to glorify God. If you are a child and live at home, start obeying your parents to glorify God. If you have kids, encourage them um, to glorify God. Um, and so start serving at home and then you can serve in the church and in the community. Um, you can serve with children or youth um, if you love Jesus. And, and you if you like kids like and can kids. pass a background check. Yes, liking kids <laughs> is very important. Um, but there's so many different ways to serve at church. Um, you can make coffee, you can serve on the security team or the medical team. Um, there's so many different ways. We're gonna have signups in a couple weeks um, for Halloween and Night to Shine, so you can serve the community that way. If you like working with your hands and building things, Pete mentioned it earlier, you can go to Mexico with Robert in three weeks and build a home for a family who has nothing. Um, but there are endless ways that you can use your gifts and abilities that God has blessed you with um, to glorify him. And if you have more questions, fill out one of those serve cards that's in the seat, drop it in one of the offering boxes and we'll connect with you this week or talk to us after service. Yeah. See, everyone is created and gifted to serve, to make a difference in this world. And everyone is created in the image of God. That's you. And I hope and pray that this has helped you to understand how to read scripture better and how to embrace how God made you and what he wants you to do in terms of serving him. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for the way that you love us, for the reality that you created us, and you called that creation good. And Father, I pray first and foremost that every person here and that's listening would know you, would love you, and would surrender to you and then would embrace the truth of your word and live according to it. Because God, you wanna bless us, you wanna lead us to life and hope and joy, uh, and your word is truth. So Father, uh, show us how we can do better at home, show us how we can do better in the community, show us how we can be people who represent the love of Christ with every person that we meet. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. Everyone is created and gifted to make a difference in this world. At Calvary, we believe that men and women are equal creations. However, we have been made with different accountabilities. If today's message spoke to you and you would like to support the ministry of Calvary, you can do so by visiting our website, calvaryaz.com. The homepage has links to contact us, to give, listen to past sermons, and subscribe to the Word for the Day daily devotionals. That's it for today. I hope you'll join us again next week. Bye-bye.